بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه مباركا عليه كما يحب ربنا ويرضى جل جلاله عما نواله والصلاة والسلام على سيد الحبيب المصطفى صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في القرآن المجيد والفرقان الحميد كلوا واشربوا ولا تسرفوا وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم كما رواه مسلم قد أفلح من أسلم قد أفلح من أسلم ورزق كفافا وقنعه الله بما آتاه وفي رواية الترمذي قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم طوبى لمن هدي للإسلام وكان عيشه كفافا وقنع وقال تعالى وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم ازهد في الدنيا يحبك الله وازهد فيما عند الناس يحبك الناس او كما قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم so my dear respected listeners brothers السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته it's this holiday period this end of year season which they call the christmas season and one of the distinctions about this season one of the special things about this season that affects all of us is that that's when the sales come on. It's a time when, because of the traditions at Christmas to buy gifts for people, the obligation of buying gifts for those that you know and those you'll be visiting and those that will be visiting you, the, the stores, they try to play into that whole scene and try to increase the economy. So the government is supporting this and everybody, this is what it's measured by. 2.5 billion spent in one day, right? Uh, how much of that is necessary? How much of that is unnecessary? That's the question that people need to ask themselves. Of course, it's a nice thing to give gifts to somebody. It creates love, it creates a bond. However, many people at this time actually go into self-indulgence mode. It's not just about buying things for others. In fact, a lot of what's going to be purchased is going to be for oneself. People looking for deals, people looking to upgrade, people looking for the next best thing out there. So people are looking for the next best thing out there. For example, I have a, a Nexus 4, I believe. A Google, Google for Nexus 4, is that, well, that's what it refers to. And the, the, the number 5 is out. So every time somebody sees me, oh, the, your, the 5 is out, you should get that one. So why? Because it's got better battery or it's, it does be something better, faster processor. I'm like, you know what, this phone, mashallah, it's, it's doing well for me right now. I've got no hitches. There's nothing on there that it doesn't do that I would like it to do. So yes, it might be nice and sleeker to get the next one. But personally, I think this is fine. And really and honestly, I would think that it would be wrong for me to buy the next one. Because I don't need it. Because at the end of the day, I got an email the other day. The guy saying that I want to get a, um, what do you call it, a Samsung Note. Right, which costs a lot of money. A note, a nice note costs a lot of money. But he says that the only reason I'm hesitant is because if people see me with the note, they'll make fun of me. Right, I'm like, what world are you living in? He says, yeah, they'll make fun of me because I don't have the latest iPhone. Like, note is completely fine. I mean, you know, I don't mind a note. You know, you've got more screen space. You can do stuff on it. Because no, they'll make fun of me. So I said, look, at the end of the day, how long are you going to keep people happy? <coughs> how, long are you going to, uh, how long are you going to entertain the whims and desires of people? So subhanAllah, now it's not just about what we want for ourselves. It's what we want for others. And we actually beat them into doing that. We beat them into buying things. We force them, we pressure them. We must never come under that, otherwise that is exactly what Islam came to diminish. People from the slavery of people to the slavery of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So yes, if there is something that you need, so for example, you need to upgrade to a bigger phone, because it does certain things that will be beneficial for you from a worldly perspective, or from a ukhrawi perspective, which means you know, for the sake of the hereafter, then absolutely that could be justified. For example, there's somebody I know, they've got a you know, particular phone and it keeps getting, uh, it's supposed to be quite a new phone, one year old, but it keeps getting filled up. There's this mystery one gigabyte that it keeps taking, the, some Windows phone. So they're constantly having to clean everything out and delete things all the time. Now they've got justification there to go and get something else if they need to. 
But really, if I went and bought another phone for 400 pounds, 300 pounds, whatever, I would feel like really I've wasted my money. Yes, it'd be nicer, but it would be a waste of my money. That's, that's the way you need to think of these things. You need something and Allah has given you the ability, go get it. You know, use it if you need it. But if you don't need something, there's no need to upgrade to the next thing. The most weirdest thing that we're living in, in this time and age, and this was not like this 50, 70 years ago. The economic system, the demands of this system that we're living in, is totally against the concept of qana'ah in Islam. The Prophet ﷺ, in the hadith that I've just uh, related to you, the Prophet ﷺ said, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ أَسْلَمَ Falah has been gained by the one who has submitted. The Muslim, the one who has submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's gained falah. Falah means this eternal success. Not just a success of this world where it's a short-lived success. You can only gloat, you can only boast, you can only feel excited about it for a short moment, and then within a few days, or a, it wears out. Maybe two years you can be you know, uh, satisfied with your success, but eventually you need another success, you need more successes, you need a series of successes. But falah means such a success after which there will be no failure. Such an honor after which there will be no dishonor. So in this world, people can put you up there, and then they can put you down there, right? And so you're honored at a certain time, and then you lose your glory, and then suddenly it's somebody else's turn. But in the hereafter, everybody has a turn. Allah will give you honor and glory like never before, after which there will be no dishonor. So success after which there will be no failure. Honor after which there will be no humiliation and above all closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after there will be no distance. Today in this world the way we live is that if we get a bit pious, we've heard a good khutbah, we heard a good bayan, we've read something, something bad happens in our life, we have a shortcoming, suddenly we get close to Allah. And we're doing all of these salat and we're reading tasbih and this, that and the other. And then after the next week we're doing something else. And then the third week we're back to doing this and then the fourth week we're doing something else again. There's no istiqama. We're told to do istiqama. Istiqama means to be balanced approach. That's why the Prophet ﷺ made it easy for us. He said, I'm not telling you to go and do so much that you can't handle it. And next day you're, you're done, you're finished. It's about doing a small but regular amount. That's why there's some people when I tell them, look, we must read some Quran every day. And they say, we don't have the time. I said, fine. All you have to do is pick up the Quran and read two ayats. Two verses. That's it. But pick up the Quran to do it. Don't just kind of read it by heart and think I've done it. I know Yasin by heart. I know Qul Wallahu Ahad by heart. So I've read my Quran for the day. No, pick up the Quran, open it, and read two ayahs. That's all you do every day. And you will see in the after a week you'll feel a bit foolish. Right? But you'll get used to it. So it's about becoming regular in doing something. But the Prophet ﷺ said, Falah, this eternal, ultimate success after which there's no failure, will be gained by the one who becomes a believer, a Muslim. And not just that, but وَرُزِقَ كَفَافًا وَقَنِعًا Which means the person has been granted enough to sustain themselves. Kafaf. The word kafaf comes from kafa yakuf, which means to block, prevent, to stop. So what it means to be given enough to stop is to enough to stop you from begging. It's an amazing use of the word. So Allah has given you kaf, it's given you sufficiency. He's given you enough that you no longer have to ask anybody. Meaning you will survive on this if you wanted to. That's the thing. If you don't have this concept of sufficing with what you have, then nothing is ever enough for you. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said very clearly, and believe me, I'm telling you from experience, that's how you feel. Right? Because that's just the way our nafs is. We have a propensity to just want more and diversity and guarantees and securities. But at the end of the day, if we fall prey to that, then we're never going to be satisfied except when the soil of our grave will fill our mouths. That's the only thing that will make us satisfied that no more. That's the thing about this. That's why the Prophet ﷺ said the success is for the one who's Muslim, who's a believer, he's given kafaf, he's given enough, and he has qana'ah. Now remember this term qana'ah. Qana'ah means 
to be content with whatever Allah has chosen for you. To be content with what Allah has chosen for you. And believe me, in this country, we have to be really satisfied with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what He has given us. Because you know, if you don't work, you still get. How many people are living in this country that they've not worked, they refuse to work. And why do they refuse to work? Because they said, we're getting enough for free. The welfare state. And that's a bad thing. That's another story. I don't want to go into that right now. Right? But mashallah, we get left, right and center, child benefit, this benefit, that benefit, this, that and the other. We must be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Live in some of these other countries and you'll find that you'll be struggling on the street. That's why if you keep looking at people who have more than you, as the Prophet sallallahu said, then you will never be satisfied because you're looking at a friend, he's just got the new phone, a new car, new, you know, clothing, whatever it is, you'll want that as well. The more you see, the more you're attracted to it. That's just the way we are. We just have to face up to it. That's the way we are. So for example, what's going on at this period of time is people are going shopping. Literally, they, a lot of people, they don't really need anything. But they're still going out shopping just to catch a sale, just to get a deal, right? Just to put some money out. That, that's a, I mean, how many of us have been out there just for that reason? Right? We're all guilty of it. Right? We've been out there just to go and look for something that's on sale. I might find a deal. And we end up buying stuff. Now again, there's nothing wrong in buying stuff. But it needs to be a reason why we're doing things. Because a Muslim, a believer is purposeful. A believer has purpose in this world. And if, when we say purpose, we don't just mean a ultimate purpose. Because if you have an ultimate purpose, everything we do has to be focused on that. And that's what's important to understand. So, the way success... Uh, the way success is measured nowadays is by how the economy is doing. What it means by the way economy is doing is how many people are getting out and spending. That's the way economy, that's the way success of any country and stability or health of any country is, uh, is measured. Which is really a weird measure. Because that doesn't prove success, it doesn't prove happiness. In fact, when uh, Time or other, another magazine, when they did a particular poll of the countries of the world, they found out that some of the poorest countries had the greatest levels of happiness within, within their people, within their subjects. And yet today, we've got people who are depressed, we've got probably more people dying from you know depression related uh, 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 depression related diseases and illnesses and problems in this country than we have to, from terrorism, right? But yet there's more money being spent on terrorism than there is on alcohol related deaths. Two and a half thousand people a year die from alcohol. It's am- it's amazing. It's ajib. There are so many people that are dying from substance overdoses. They're, they're crazy. They're, they're, they're in a problem. There, there are, there, you know, there's another, there, there, uh, just the other day I'm on a, on a group and somebody said he found a, an embryo, he found a, a, a miscarried baby, uh, sorry, a, a, a fetus on the street. What should I do with it? Can I go and bury it? I said, make sure you don't just bury it yourself. Go and report it, otherwise you'll be, you know, you'll be done for, I don't know what, right? So we, the uh, success of a country or of a people is not by how much they have spending power. Because that doesn't give you satisfaction. What gives you satisfaction is how good you feel inside. How connected you feel, how full you feel inside, how spiritual you feel inside. Otherwise you feel devoid and you're buying and you're buying and you're buying. And I've actually got a term for it, it's called shopper, you know, people like this are called shopaholics. There's actually a name for it, like an alcoholic. There's a shopaholic. Right? There's, you know, there's no term for happiness you know, to, to, be, to be very happy. That's why the Prophet ﷺ said, look at people below you. And that will make you satisfied with what you have. And believe me, I sometimes sit at home and at breakfast table, you know, we've got cereals. Right? Just think of it. Any, you know, you've got cereals, you've got biscuits, you've got bread and toast, butter, honey, right? peanut butter. You've got everything. It's all available. At any given time, look at our homes, we've got everything. And the people in Syria are dying. Right? The people in Syria are dying. SubhanAllah from nothing. We drop crumbs. There's people who don't eat the edges of bread. They only eat the middle. They literally throw that away. There was a show I was listening to on, uh, on radio the other day about certain perks that people have. And there's one individual, he's saying that my perk is that I must butter every part of the bread. I just have this perk. I can't eat bread if it's not buttered like 100%. So I butter it right to the edge and he says, then I don't eat the, the sides. The crust, but I'd rather butter it than make sure that you know that, that, than risk the fact that I haven't buttered some of the inside. So I butter it right today, and then I throw. It. How much is he wasting? 
This is one individual that we're speaking about. And we are subhanAllah going in that same direction. The amount of, I mean, the amount of water we waste in, in wudu and so on. We're doing a good act, but we're wasting so much water. Maybe we're using 30 times as much, as much water that the Prophet ﷺ used. Right? I, I got the, you know, I, I understood the value of water. I was sitting in, uh, I was sitting in the haram, and I was sitting in a place in Jumu'ah, Jumu'ah Salat, and I, there was no way I could go out to do wudu. I literally did wudu with half a glass of water, just sitting there on the marble. And I don't think I dropped much. I had, I had my, my clothing on, you know, I, 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 the way I just kind of did it, I did it in half a cup of water. I said, well, it is possible. It is possible, because if I went out, I wouldn't have got a place inside. I would have lost my, lost my prayer. So I had zamzam, and that's what I used. Subhanallah. So it's all possible. But the main thing is that this time we need to be careful. Yes, you need something, go and buy it. But if you don't need something, don't waste your time. Let me give you the example. The, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said, "Izhad fi dunya yuhibbuk Allah. Have abstinence from the world. Don't get too concerned about it. Don't want, want, want it too much, and Allah will love you." The reason is that Allah knows that His enemy is the world, though He made it. Because that's the ch- test for us. So He's saying, if you don't love the world, then Allah will love you because you are not going to His competitor, in a sense. Because once you start putting the world in your heart, then Allah, you, you're taking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is how much space you're leaving less for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's as simple as that. It sounds kind of crude, but that's what it is. Then He said, Izhad ma uh, uh, fima uh, izhad. Uh, fima in the nas and, and uh, abstain from what is in the hands of people and people will love you because you're not going to be a competitor for them in what they seek you're like just in your own world with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so they, they, don't, they don't have you know they feel secure with you they don't have any threats from you you'll become loved of the people and you will become loved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and truly that has been the case let me give you one example right when a heart is like that, how successful they can become. It's related by, um, it's related by Ibn Qudama al-Maqdisi. Right? One of the great Hanbali scholars, Ibn Qudama al-Maqdisi. He actually relates from another Hanbali scholar. His chain goes through another Hanbali scholar, Abu Faraj ibn al-Jawzi, the great Hanbali scholar of Baghdad. He says that Abu Faraj ibn al-Jawzi related to me with his chain that goes all the way up to Ja'far ibn Sulaiman. Ja'far ibn Sulaiman died in about 178 Hijri. He was a Hadith scholar. He says that he was once in the company of Malik ibn Dinar, one of these great ascetics of the past. Great, really influential individual. And he says that he was with him in Basra, in the streets of Basra. And as he was walking around, he suddenly sees, you know when you see a new construction going up, right? There's like, you know, you can see the dust in the air and there's movement and there's people coming in with supplies and so on. He saw this nice palace, you know, about to be built. There's this young, really elegant, dignified, handsome looking man who's uh, supervising this whole, you know, this, the, the, this whole um, project. And... Uh, uh, so they said, what's going on? He said, oh, this is a new palace that he is designing for himself and he's supervising the whole, uh, you know, the, the whole construction of it. So Malik ibn Dinar says to Ja'far ibn Sulaiman that, you know what, let's, let's go and make him a deal. Let's make him a better deal. Uh, you know, I, I, he felt something for this man, that he felt like he should gain a special form of guidance and reward. He said, let's go and make a deal for him. So he went up to this man and he started speaking to him. And the man didn't recognize him first as to who Malik ibn Dinar was. He didn't know, he had never met him before, he knew about him, he didn't, he, didn't, he didn't recognize him. So when people told him that this is Malik ibn Dinar, he quickly got up and he says, Haja, like, is there something I can help you with? You know, like, can I help you? You're a wealthy guy, can I help you? He says, yes, I've come to actually sell you a, a proposal. Right, you know, people come to your door, they sell you this investment and that life insurance and so on. I come to sell you a proposal. He says, what is it? He said, the proposal is that I will give you, I will, I, I will, I, I will guarantee for you a, 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 a special palace that will be made of, you know, the rubies it will be studded with rubies and pearls and so on. And the smell of it will be must. You know, when you go into certain stores today and there's a nice smell because they have a re- special fragrance system and it just smells really nice. Well, this will be must throughout, 100% it's all the time because the motor of it is must. Zafran, you know, all the best products will be used, all the best supplies will be used to make this. And you know what? The greatest thing is that no hand would have made this. So there will be no human error here, right? So it won't be any touched by any human. It will just be made by Al Aziz Al Hakim who will say, Kun Fayakun, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make it for you by just saying, Kun, and it will be. So now, Somebody comes to you with that kind of a proposal, right? The biggest scholar in town comes to you with that proposal. How would our response be? We're finally getting our palace made. 
right? This is what I've been wanting for a very long time. I've got all the material now, all my money's together, my funding is there. Now this is what it's going to be. And then suddenly I get this proposal, right? Subhanallah. So he says, this is what he said. He said, you know what, give me tonight. Let me think about it. Let me think about it. It's a moment, it, you know, it, it's a special moment. He said, let me think about it. So, Malik ibn Dinar goes back, he says, fine, he goes back, and at night he makes dua. He prays salat, probably tahajjud, and he makes dua for this man. He, you, you can imagine what kind of dua. I've guaranteed in this, you know, this better work out. So, he goes and makes his dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The next day he goes in the morning, early, and the man is actually waiting there. As soon as he sees Malik ibn Dinar, he jumps up, he's like, you know, he is like, he's, he's like you know, you don't know what he's going to say. He says, I, I accept the deal. And he pulls out a paper, he brings somebody, a scribe, because in those days you had scribes, he brings a, a scribe, and then Malik ibn Dinar writes it down, هذا ما ضمن لي Malik ibn Dinar, this kind of a house which will be in a shaded area, right? All of these descriptions are written down. It will be in a nice shaded area, it will be like this, that and the other, and this will be given to him for a hundred thousand dirhams, because that's what it was going to, that's actually, I forgot to mention, that is the proposal, that I'll sell you this for a hundred thousand thousand dirhams. The hundred thousand that you're going to spend in making this palace in the world, that is what I'll give you this greater Paris in, uh, a palace in the hereafter. So that's all written down, hundred thousand. Done. Khalas. Malik ibn Dinar comes back. Right? He comes back and uh, it's been about 35, 40 days. And one day Malik ibn Dinar got up in the morning and he's praying Fajr prayer. After Fajr prayer, he notices that certificate that he had made and given to this person, right? He sees it on the, uh, on the side, it just, just there by where he prayed. He was very astonished. He picks it up and it's there, the certificate, everything is written there. He turns it around and he says that it was written bila midadin, without ink that you could see. But there, were, there was writing on there without ink. Now, if that was said 150 years ago, 10 years ago, it's like, what are you talking about? Writing without ink? Today we have inkless displays, right? So we can completely understand. So he says it was written there, and what was written is, هَذِهِ بَرَاءَةٌ مِنَ اللَّهِ الْعَزِيزِ الْحَكِيمِ لِمَالِكِ بْنِ دِينَارِ إِنَّا وَفَّيْنَ الشَّابَ الْقَصْرَ الَّذِي دَمِنْتَ, دمنت لَهُ وَسَبْعِينَ ضِعْفًا زِيَادَةً that we have, this is bara, this is exoneration, this is a fulfillment for Malik ibn Dinar, for what you guaranteed that man, right? For we have fulfilled and fully given, fully given, right? Fully paid off this, uh, this palace uh, for, for this person that you had guaranteed for him, and 70 times that amount. So it's going to be 70 times better than what you even promised him. Malik ibn Dinar, I mean, he saw this, he's totally like astonished, amazed. He takes this and he runs to that guy's house. He gets there, the doors are closed, but he could hear all the crying from inside. Right? So when he knocks on the door, he finds out that this guy just died last night. Right? This guy just died last night. And he says, you know what? There must be something more to this, right? Because he's got the letter who, uh, which was him, and suddenly he finds it by his door with this weird invisible ink, or you know this, uh, you know, inkless uh, writing on it. So he calls the ghasil. He calls the person who did the ghusl. He says, "Tell me what happened." He says, "Well, I was called to do the ghusl, the the the, the bathing. I was burying him, but I was told uh, 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 by his family, whoever it was, that there's this letter that he has made wasiyah. He had he has bequested that this be put in between." between his kafan. Right? There was a letter that he gave me. That was the only thing weird about this whole case, only strange. So Malik ibn Dinar pulls out the letter, he says, was it this letter? He says, wow, that is the letter that I put in his, in his kafan. We buried him that way. That letter went with him. Right? That letter went with him. So Malik ibn Dinar, Malik ibn Dinar then related the whole incident. And this other young chap, he gets up, he says, sell me one for 200,000. And Malik ibn Dinar says, Kana ma kan, fata ma fat. Whatever happened has happened. That time is gone. That time is lost. These are only moments that are given. This is a miracle. Now the reason, I know it sounds very mythical. It's not something that's going to happen every day for you. Or if ever, right? That's why I mentioned to you that it's not related by just any old ordinary person. It's related by some very stringent individuals, muhadditeen. Ibn Qudama al-Maqdisi al-Hanbali. Right? Anybody will respect him. 
Right, go, go and tell the story that Ibn Qudam al-Maqdisi, he relates it from Abu al-Faraj ibn al-Jawzi, again, you know, very critical scholars. And they relate this through a chain up to Ja'far ibn Sulaiman from Malik ibn dinar May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're not asking for such great miracles, but we're definitely asking for something in paradise. Right? Even if we're not given the guarantee in this world, we're told from our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that as long as you feel satisfied, then you will be satisfied. The moment you're not satisfied and you keep going to the sales, just looking, browsing and just checking, wasting your time at work as well, checking online for sales and so on. Right? That's the whole purpose of this talk. That's what I was saying. You will never always look at the people beneath you and you will be satisfied with Allah. Whatever Allah has given you, do shukr. Do shukr. Whatever, uh, uh, whatever Allah has given you, you should do shukr. And Allah will give you more. He'll give you more barakah in it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the qana'ah. Qana'ah, contentment, satisfaction with what He has given us. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us from having to ask anybody and keep us from the greed and avarice of our nafs and soul. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make His obedience close to us. Wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.